Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Southwest Center for Human Relations Studies at the University of Oklahoma for our monthly webinar series. I'm Asia Mukes, Communications and Project Manager, and we are excited about the 2019-2020 season of our monthly webinar series. Our hope is that we continue the conference's tradition of working to improve racial and ethnic relations on college campuses by providing virtual learning opportunities. This season is sure to be amazing. We have a lineup of scholars who will cover a wide range of issues, including immigration and DACA, institution reform and planning, and critical pedagogy. On October 30th, presenters from Mount San Antonio College will present Keeping the Dream Alive, a college-wide approach to embracing dreamers. The cost is $25 and registration is still open. This season, we've introduced a new student track that focuses on ideas that speak directly to the experiences of students and is either facilitated or co-facilitated by a student. They're intended to identify emerging scholars and connect students in the NCORE community to each other. Our student track webinars are always available at no cost. These sessions are held the first Wednesday of the month and Brendan Crow, a third year medical student at Georgetown University School of Medicine will be presenting on race and medical education next week. Registration is still open for that. Make sure you're live posting. We wanna know where you're watching. So tweet Instagram and Facebook pictures from your office with the hashtag Encore and start the conversation online. You may end up in a very special Encore video. Today we have Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington, president and founder of the Washington Consulting Group. Dr. Washington has served as an educator, administrator, and consultant in higher education for over 34 years. He serves as an invited instructor in the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the Lancaster Theological Seminary. He is the president and co-founder of the Social Justice Training Institute and the immediate past president of the American College Personnel Association. Reverend Dr. Washington earned his BS degree from Slippery Rock State College, a double master's of science degree from Indiana University, Bloomington, a PhD in college student development from the University of Maryland College Park, and a Master of Divinity from Howard University School of Divinity. Today, Reverend Dr. Washington will be discussing how the woke Olympics are contributing to the challenge of creating learning campus environments. The center is grateful for Reverend Dr. Washington's expertise. So I'm going to unmute you and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Washington. Thank you so much. It is indeed a pleasure uh, to be with you all in this way. Thank you all for joining us in our conversation this afternoon. And I know that there are some folks who are individually watching as well as collectively watching um, as organizations and institutions, at your organizations and institutions. So um, I want to just move us right into this. I want to start with how I kind of got uh, to this topic uh, before I move into the intentions. And so I have been, as was already named, in this conversation for many, many years, in the work of social justice, diversity, equity, inclusion, multiculturalism, all of the different languages and words that we have used to talk about what it means really to honor all of our humanity, to honor that knowing that we all operate in a context where all of us have not always been honored in our full humanities. And that there are systems and cultures set up that make that continuously challenging and ongoing work. In the last 30 years and uh, prior to that, certainly this work did not just start 30 years ago. There have been folks fighting for justice since the beginning of time. But particularly in the academy in the last 30 years or so, there has been an emphasis on developing capacity and competencies around understanding and engaging issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and social justice. What has been an outcome of that is some wonderful things. There are communities, organizations, populations, um, campuses that understand and have worked diligently to increase and uh, create greater inclusion in those spaces. A byproduct of that ed educational and learning work 
has been what I often will refer to as uh, woke Olympics and a culture of social justice arrogance in the context of higher education. And so what I mean by that is that there's been this space um, that uh, has been created that has it very difficult to sometimes be in the conversation that is in, that is in a way advancing um, our efforts. And so that's what this discussion is going to be about today. And I'm going to name what the intentions are for our time in just a moment. As you already heard, uh, NCORE's commitment for fostering inclusion, and this is another way that NCORE has made a commitment to showing up beyond our coming together annually at the conferences all across the country. Uh, please join us in New York. Uh, that was a, a little plug. Uh, but also um, in these webinar series and other kind of local and regional uh, efforts. So it is NCORE's commitment to fostering inclusion across all um, identities and creating a welcoming and inclusive space. We also want to start with our land acknowledgement and I would like to acknowledge the land that I'm uh, on today. I'm doing this meeting as the original homeland of the Lumbee, the Piscataway and the Cherokee tribes. I acknowledge that the painful history and the genocide and forced removal from this territory and we honor the respect the many diverse indigenous people still connected to the land on which uh, I am positioned today here in Maryland. Without them, we would not have access to this gathering or this dialogue. We take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this space. One of the things that happens as I um, even now acknowledge the land is it is another one of those dynamics that shows up in Woke Olympics. Uh, and we'll talk more about that as we move on. But as we acknowledge the land, uh, it is my hopes that this just doesn't become a part of how we acknowledge whether one is woke or not, but that we actually spend time and energy engaged in what it really means to pause and acknowledge where we are. I also like to add as I stop and pause, as we honor all of our ancestry, as we honor the 1619, this 400th anniversary of the original slave ships arriving uh, here on these shores, that we not take for granted that there is a legacy of genocide that has happened within communities of African descent as well, as we also acknowledge all ways in which oppression has been a part of our experience, such that we don't take for granted those who've gone before us to make it possible for us to do our parts to make this space better. We breathe in the truth of those whose shoulders that we stand on as we move forward in our conversations today. Thank you. Intentions for our time today is really to create a space for deeper levels of authentic engagement about the dynamics on the impact of woke Olympics and social justice arrogance, particularly in the context of higher education, but not just in higher education. So, uh, if you're listening to us and you're, you work or you engage in a context that's other than that of um, traditional higher education, uh, please know that all of what is gonna be said, much of what will be said is going to be relevant for you as well. It might just be nuanced in your context. We're gonna talk about what, what, that, what that means. And what I wanna do is, while if we were at a conference space, we would actually have the space to kind of join up and get in pairs or get in dyads or small groups and really deepen the level of authentic conversation. But my intention in this space is to give you some stuff so that you can get deeper in real talk and pay attention to what that means. We want to consider these dynamics and, uh, uh, and how they met these dynamics, how these manifest, how these dynamics manifest often in sabotage efforts of diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice work. So what I'm offering here is that the dynamics of woke Olympics and social justice arrogance actually does harm to the very efforts that we are trying to um, address. Uh, and we want to talk some about what that means and what that looks like. The next thing is to offer some insights that informs what are, what's at the root of these dynamics. So um, as I along with many of my colleagues who have been actively and engaged in the work. We wanna just offer you some insights about what that's about and 
where that comes from, as well as um, uh, some, some thoughts around the last thing there is to share some tips and ideas for engaging these challenges as they occur. So that's where we are. That's um, what our hopes are as we begin uh, this conversation today. Please uh, feel free to use the chat feature um, to share your questions um, at, at any particular point, and we will uh, stop about 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes before um, the ending time so that we can address some of those. It is our hopes to be able to address as many as possible. I uh, love being able to share in this way and uh, know that the format sometimes uh, can be challenging for engaged conversation, but we will get some questions and answers in there as we move forward. So let us go. As we start our conversations today about Woke Olympics, I want to invite us to think about what, what do we mean? And so when you consider Woke Olympics, what are the things that comes to mind for you? How would you define Woke Olympics and or social justice arrogance? Uh, I'm excited about the number of folks who decided that they wanted to sign on for this because it says to me, uh, just like it said to me when I was at Portland and I offered this as a full session, the room um, uh, indicated that folks felt like this was a conversation that needed to be had. And so let me share what um, I have, Woke Olympics and Social Justice Arrogance, and I just um, have shortened it with an acronym to WOSJA. Uh, and uh, we can use that or not use it, but it's just uh, a way to kind of shorthand this. And so what do I mean when I talk about social justice arrogance? I'm talking about um, Woke Olympics. I'm talking about the dynamic, this dynamic that refers to the weaponization of social justice knowledge and understanding. What I mean by that is I'm talking about how what I know about language, what I know about uh, dynamics or things that are occur uh, around oppression, diversity, exclusion, and how I use that knowing and understanding to make others uh, less than or not knowing. Uh, so the, the very fact that I know to name um, my, my pronouns as mine are he, him, his, and I remember to do that at the beginning of each session or each space that I enter, the fact that I do or do not do a land acknowledgement, the fact that I do or do not understand the difference in gender identity and sexual orientation, the fact that I do or do not understand the complexities of the X in Latinx and Latina experiences, and I could go on and on and on, but my knowledge around a breath of or a particular um, identity, um, that knowledge being weaponized such that uh, anyone not knowing it uh, is harmed for not knowing it. This dynamic creates an environment uh, of competition. Who knows the most current, up-to-date, and popular information about a social justice issue? And so the, the latest reading, the latest article, the latest um, tweet, uh, the latest Facebook posting, the latest um, information about a particular issue, um, the latest dissertation that's been written. Um, and so uh, do you know what's the, the current and the most um, popularized or what's trending around a particular piece? And that creates a dynamic of competition, um, often within organizations, sometimes within classes or cohorts of classes. Um, and so dynamic of competition that creates harm. It creates a shaming and a blaming environment um, and makes it uncomfortable, almost wrong, to not be informed. One of the dilemmas and challenges around this is uh, the expectation that you would and or should know, given your role, um, given your uh, stated commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, given what the institution says about what it values. Um, and so if you don't, um, and, and it is all, not always stated, as I talk about creating a shaming, blaming environment, it's not always even necessarily stated in a shaming, blaming, uh, using that, those language, that word, those words or that language. It is often just the energy that is created 
Um, it can be, uh, I talk about often in my sessions, the meetings after the meeting. And so um, it's how we talk about when people don't know or how we show up sending nonverbal communication messages uh, when someone missteps or, or doesn't know a particular thing. Um, I was in a session a little bit ago and uh, we were, someone was referring to the show Pose. Some of you may know that. Um, it's one of the premier and very powerful um, ex shows that is naming and talking about and um, exploring the experiences of queer folks, particularly trans uh, women of color. And this person referred to Pose as Posse. Um, and so, and they talked about it as one of their favorite shows. And the energy that was in the room for those who knew that the title or the pronunciation was Pose was one that created blaming and shaming, as an example. The dynamic is often one that is rooted in intellectual and cognitive knowing and manifest in ways that does not advance DE&I, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and social justice effort. And so when I talk about cognitive knowing, it is often uh, uh, there is, there's informational knowing, um, there is intellectual. Uh, I've read something, I've been in uh, community with those who have had the privilege of being in the advanced study of this area, whatever the particular area is, or um, identity-based discussion is. Um, and it, because it often shows up from a place of intellectual arrogance, that it then sabotages and does not advance the efforts because folks then feel like when they're in the room with uh, folks who are more woke than them or social justicely arrogant, folks often don't feel like they can ask a question. Um, what's becoming more and more commonplace as an example is that we would have people as they get into a room or introduce themselves and we invite folks to share their pronouns how long they've been there and what brings them to the session today and often um, in spaces depending upon where you are the sharing of pronouns is not something that everyone has had a lot of experience doing but even as folks begin to recognize okay um, I identify the same way as this person does, and I know to say that my pronouns are he, him, and his, or um, she, her, and hers. I still don't know why I'm sharing my pronouns, or I don't understand the impact of not sharing them. And so the, the um, intellectual arrogance or the intellect, rooted in intellectualism is really often about this cognitive, this is what we should do, um, and sometimes not about why we should or, or how it impacts and um, what's the um, affective and emotional um, impact of this, whatever the particular dynamic is. Finally, um, I talk about Woke Olympics as also often it creates an environment of us, them, in and out, woke and clueless. Um, and so we begin to talk about folks in those contexts uh, and, and folks begin to experience an in, in and out, us and them uh, dynamic within our campuses and within our communities. And um, those dynamics, again, as I said earlier, often sabotage our efforts. Because you know, the, what I experience as I'm often on campuses and with or, in organizations is when we have the invited opportunities to deepen our understandings, build our capacity um, to uh, engage more effectively within, about, and across difference and create environments that operate and engage at the institutional, individual, interpersonal, um, as well as the group levels. What I often hear when I go into a room is folks will often say, this is the <clears throat> likely suspects. The same people always come to this. Um, and I, you will hear me, if you've ever heard me refer to this notion of often people talk about this in the context of, Jamie, you're preaching to the choir. This is a choir dynamic. And I look around the room and they look around the room and they say, yes, I knew he was going to be there. I knew, I knew they were going to be there. I knew she was going to be there. 
uh, be here. Um, but these aren't, the, we aren't the people who need to be here, right? Um, and this whole dynamic of woke Olympics and social justice arrogance um, invites us to consider what's our role as choir members um, and how do we as choir members contribute to people not showing up and not coming and participating in the ongoing learning and building of capacity. I often will tease that I have also, in addition to being in higher education for over 34 years, I've had 40 years of experience as a music minister. And one of the things I know about the choir is that we need rehearsal. And sometimes the challenge is that choir members want to show up and perform not having been at rehearsal. Um, and so some of the building of capacity is about how do I build capacity to be in community and to be in engagement with folks who may not have had all of the experiences, all of the questions, all of the learning, all of the community opportunities that I have had. With that, that's my um, uh, wanting to name what, what I mean by woke Olympics and social justice arrogance. Many of you might have uh, additional or other things to add to that, but that's um, how I come to um, begin and talk about this topic. What I want to invite you to is consider your own experience. And I want you to think about a story or a situation, uh, let it come into your mind around uh, Woja. Um, what's been your experience with these dynamics? How do you feel in those moments and what do you do? And so I just uh, invited you for a moment to just think about, reflect on a moment when you felt like social justice knowing was weaponized, when you felt like it wasn't okay to make a mistake, when you noticed someone made a mistake or didn't say the right word or didn't use the right um, language or entered around pronouns not as effectively and the feeling that was in the room, the feeling that was in you. Um, what happened in that moment? What did you do? What did others do in that space? I just wanna allow yourself to embody um, the realities of this dynamic. If, if you don't feel like you've ever kind of been in a space where you've experienced some of this playing out, you know, that's okay. You, um, but I am inviting those who have to consider the situation. I name that these dynamics can often sabotage diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts because that's what I've experienced. And so I want you to consider what has been the impact, what did the impact have uh, on the moment or the situation. So whether someone got called out on something that they did or they didn't get called out um, and, and it just kind of let it ride, but there was a meeting after the meeting, or there was a meeting in the meeting where folks just began to text its messages, or there was simply the eye rolling um, uh, in, in the particular situation. I want us to be able to hold what was the impact and how did that advance social justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, and how did it help us to move forward? My experience, again, is that it often uh, shuts down and creates an energy uh, in the room of shame and blame, and it not being okay not to know. I want you to think about where do you get stuck and or struggle as it relates to these dynamics? One of the things that often uh, occurs is that there are those of us who um, are experiencing these dynamics, woke Olympics and social justice arrogance, and we simply don't know what to do in that moment. Um, if I enter um, in a way that invites a challenge to the social justice arrogance or woke Olympics, then I'm liable to again experience again the wrath of the weaponization um, because there's not a consciousness around the impact it might feel like I'm rescuing um, the person who made a mistake. And if I'm doing that as a person of color and this happens to be a white person who's done it, then I'm showing up operating in collusion or out of my own internalized oppression. And how do I navigate not wanting to do that? And I don't wanna rescue 
the white person or as a cis woman not wanting to rescue a man or a cis man, but what I am actually intending to do is create a space for their learning. And if I decide to engage in that, then do I get seen as a sellout or as um, actually doing harm to the person who was trying to call them out on whatever they missed? So this is a, a dynamic, um, and I just wanted to give you a moment to think about when you've been in that, how did you feel, what did you do, what was the impact of the situation? So did the person, did the person learn? Is, was, the, was, the, did the, was there good learning for the group? Did that help our conversations to move forward? Did it not? Um, and, uh, and then what's the stuck places and the struggle places for, for any of us? With that, I want to just share for a moment what I have experienced um, as some of the ways that Woke Olympics can show up. My hope is that you can see some of this, um, that it's showing up uh, clearly for you. When I started this conversation, I was actually considering what are the key concepts and dynamics that are showing up in the current moment where people use the knowledge around it, um, their knowing about it to uh, weaponize and make others less than or make others not as um, down or as woke. And so I started this and what you'll notice here is about 49 or 50 different dynamics that I'm naming. Um, and this is not to be an all exhaustive uh, list of the current day dynamics around diversity, equity, and inclusion, but it is to offer some of and many of the things that I have seen woke Olympics show up in and around. And so as you look at this list, um, I invite you to think about what you've seen and, or experienced and to consider, in fact, uh, where you feel woke and where you don't um, and where you feel like you have some understanding and where you might have even experienced some woke Olympics being thrown kind of at you because you weren't as down with a particular issue. And so just a quickie uh, to move us through here. We're talking about power and privilege, entitlement, internalized dominance, marginalized and minoritized, internalized oppression, horizontal hostility. And those are dynamics that we um, experience and we hear and we, we're talking about and how much do I know about that and am I able to talk about that? And how have I had the words, um, you're coming out of your power and privilege um, used against me, white fragility, and white tears. What is white fragility? What is white tears? First Amendment and free speech. Um, how we talk about, how we understand uh, those dynamics the, uh, and how they again impact these conversations. Battle fatigue, and I've put that in quotes because there's all kinds of battle fatigue, but it's often coined in the context of racial battle fatigue and weariness. Cultural fluency and uh, competence. Um, micro aggressions, implicit bias, collusion, complicity, intent and impact, accumulative impact, and perfectly logical explanations. What do I know about that? Ally and or versus accomplices. Um, and the dynamics of what the difference are um, in that. Uh, connected to that, it's all often also is uh, safe space versus brave space, or safe space and brave space. Um, mansplaining, uh, misogyny, uh, Title IX issues in entering our uh, legal uh, dynamics. Uh, Self-care, and is uh, self-care, um, community care, uh, how we should be talking about that um, uh, uh, today. Uh, the non-binary, uh, universal design, uh, what is social justice, diversity, inclusion, and equity, how those get defined in absolute ways in different spaces. What's the DREAM Act and um, an understanding of DREAM Act and DACA. Um, the demand culture and uh, 
as we talk about the culture of demand and on many of our campuses where there's been um, uprisings and expectations of shifting the culture there that's shown up in a way that is not inviting necessarily folks to um, be a part, be, be engaged in a process, it's demanding immediate culture change. Hear me as I say all of this, this isn't, none of, none of this is about judgment, it's about one of some of the ways the dynamics show up. Millennials, centennials, um, so, uh, social media, the Trump effect, individual group and organizations, managing and noticing triggers in Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, colonization, ethnocentrism, environmental justice, size oppression, age, ism, classism, Christian hegemony, intersectionality, and intersecting identities, neoliberalism, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, woke Olympics and social justice arrogance, and more. Dr. So, Washington, we yes. have two questions. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, Moses Davis asked if the colors coordinate to certain groupings. The, the colors coordinate to what the PowerPoint did. Um, <laughs> um, as, I, as I continue to add, they do not, it does not color, coordinate to any groupings. That's an interesting thing though, but no. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Was there another? Um, I thought that I saw someone raise their hand. Yes, someone. Um, Dipali, would you mind putting your question in the question and answer box and then we can answer it in that way. So if you, um, so LaKendra asks, will you have an opportunity to capture the presentation slides? So will you be giving your slides out after the presentation? Yes, I will. Okay, all right. What I am going to do is I'm going to um, allow Dr. Washington to continue his um, presentation and then we'll take questions at the end. Mm -hmm. This is fine. And, and I, don't, I don't mind um, if you want to do this and pause me in the middle, that, that's okay. fine as well. And we can also, I am so also going to create space for questions at the end. So if something is coming up and I said something that was unclear or you're just like, well, what did you mean by that or say more about that? That is absolutely fine. Okay. Um, so okay. You. you just you just flash back on and say, I got a question right here, and that's fine. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back off. So when I come on, that'll be somebody has a question. A couple of questions. All right, exactly. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So again, folks, as I name, I don't have this to be a start all and end all. And what I'm offering is the ways in which I have seen social justice um, dynamics and issues weaponized. Um, and what I want to invite you to think about is, what do I know about some of this? What do I know about all of this? What do I not know about any of it? Um, and um, you get to show up more woke the more you know. Uh, and how do I use the knowledge, the experience, the information, the knowing that I have around all of this, which is all that matters and it is important in terms of helping us to continue to move ourselves in our organizations and our campuses and communities forward. Um, but how do I, you know, kind of build my capacity in knowing around this, but also build my capacity to be able to engage it? I want to offer um, next for us to consider um, all uh, a number of the ways in which um, knowledge, uh, what informs some of the uh, Woke Olympic stuff. And so one of the things that I have experienced is that we come at this knowing and at these topics from a myriad of interdisciplinary ways of knowing. Um, and sometimes woke Olympics can show up as if my disciplinary way or my lens through which I enter the conversation is the way that we should be engaging and or thinking about this discussion. And so, for example, um, I might show up as identifying as a sociologist that says um, engaging this conversation requires a sociological um, analysis and perspective. And that perspective is more than a psychological perspective. 
or that perspective is more important than an economics perspective or um, the law perspective is more important than the educational perspectives. And so I just want to offer that um, all of these interdiscipline, all of these disciplines and ways of knowing and making sense are important as we address the issues. So sociology, psychology, history, physiology, okay, um, how this matters and what impact it has in our bodies, our biology, anthropology, understanding, our theology, and sometimes the whole notion of how we operate theologically um, in the world, um, and what that means is an important part of this discussion and is often an unnamed. Um, the legal, law, uh, linguistics, organizational um, leadership and behavior. So as we talk about how we do organization and cultural change, um, uh, how that dynamic informs the knowing, economics, um, education, and more. I just offer in this space these 12 um, knowledge bases, but there are more certainly as we consider how um, the, the Olympics can show up, the dynamics can show up, and when we show up in this absolute one box matters more than the other box, or one discipline matters more or is more important than the other disciplines, then we can miss some really important and powerful learning um, that might inform and help our um, engaging around the conversation. You'll see the graphic. Um, or the image next to the knowledge base. And um, I want to just offer what I believe is one of the ways that social justice arrogance, um, how it plays out, um, and how it can often stall out our efforts. And I often refer to this as the three C's. Um, and that is convincing, converting, and convicting. And, uh, and I just want to put this, these C's in the context of how when I'm talking about uh, creating environments where it is okay not to know, um, and I don't have to um, have all of the right words in the language, um, I'm talking about a learning environment, um, a learning organization, or a space where it is okay for people to be exploring and considering. And so I really wanted to name that context because sometimes we're in a context um, that isn't about necessarily people exploring, engaging, and learning. Um, I find that most of the time in higher education, I would hope that we are in that context, but I do understand that that's not always the space that folks are operating in. And so please hear this in the context of creating a learning environment, inviting people into um, a knowing um, and, in, and a way to engage for themselves. So I often will say, particularly the folks who I am helping to prepare and build their capacity to facilitate and engage um, around social justice, diversity, and equity and is issues, that, um, that if, if you're in a classroom situation and you're teaching content um, to a population, you know, the, through any of the disciplines or, or whatever. Um, I'm not talking about that necessarily kind of context. Um, we all know that there is material that needs to be co covered in sociology 101 and 301 and history 205 and, and so on and so forth. So um, in those spaces, we're talking about a different kind of engagement. And, um, that can be another webinar altogether. In this space, as I talk about these three C's, I am talking about whether I'm in a meeting and in a conversation with a colleague or uh, in a staff development or doing a student learning uh, space or session, I want us to pay attention to inviting a space where folks can um, consider things. And so if we're avoiding convincing, converting, and convicting, then we create the space for learning. So if I'm showing up, with the intention of convincing you that what I know is right and what you know is wrong, um, that's a very different energy than um, my showing up inviting you uh, into a conversation or a dialogue with me. 
uh, it creates the energy of right and wrong. I need to convince you that this is the way to go. If I show up intending to convert you, um, then my engagement with you um, is not a successful engagement unless you have come over to my way, unless you have come over to my way of thinking, using my language, engaging in the way. So I'm trying to convince you so that I can convert you to a particular way of thinking or I'm convicting you and wanting you to feel badly because of what you're knowing or your thinking is. Um, and um, so if I've not converted you, I minimally want you to feel convicted um, in terms of how you engage with me. Looks like we've got some questions. I'll take a pause there. Yes. So Mohammed at the Mills International Center at the University of Oregon asked, what are your thoughts on the intersection between social justice work and political correctness? If there are any, is there any danger with that? And how do we promote social justice without making social justice an ideology of its own to avoid the quote competition sense? Yeah. So um, thank you for your question, Mohammed. I just want to um, make sure I'm capturing. So the difference between political correctness and social justice knowing? Did I get that right? And the intersection between social justice work and political correctness. Sure. Um, yeah. 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 And so uh, the, the challenge uh, around that is what do we mean when we say political correctness? Right? So, um, so social justice work and political correctness. So when someone will say to me, um, uh, you know, if I start um, uh, naming uh, my pronouns and before I would gender anyone, I invite them to um, share with me what, what their pronoun is. Um, so I don't, so I actively practice not uh, operating out of my assumption uh, around um, who people, uh, how people identify um, or what folks gender identity is um, as, as that is maybe different from their gender expression or whatever. Um, if I take the time to say, um, do you, are your pronouns he, him, and his, or she, or they, you know, I take that time. If someone names that as political correctness, I would push back on that in that what I would say is that what you are framing as political correctness, I would frame as an intention to honor who people are. Right. Um, if uh, you are naming my starting this session with uh, uh, with a land acknowledgement as political correctness, I would say that differently. Um, in terms of my intention is to recognize the space and really truly honor um, where I get to occupy and whose homeland it was. Um, and so I think sometimes we conflate political correctness or use political correctness as a way, again, it's another way, uh, I think at some levels of weaponizing um, and um, resisting and sabotaging the effort. So if political correctness, quote unquote, gets, gets named as a way to, to shut down the conversation, um, I just invite a reframing of political correctness. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, pe people have said, to me, well, you were just being politically correct. I say, well, if you would have my caring about how people get seen and see themselves as being politically correct, then I guess I am that then, but that's not um, what I mean by it. what, what I'm doing. That's not why I'm doing it. I'm not trying to um, be politically correct. I'm trying to live congruent with my value around humanity. You're on mute. So the second part of that was, how do we uh, promote social justice without making social justice an ideology of its own? Right, yeah. Uh, to avoid the competition sense. Yeah, so that, that that's, that's what this whole conversation is about in many ways. It is... Um, you know, I, I think that you kind of social justice, um, diversity and equity work, you know, in, in any area, in any discipline, it can, you know, kind of be its own thing and it's an ideology of its own. 
how we then share that is the space that we have to be careful of um, creating the weaponization and kind of the competition around. So we get to share that in a way that acknowledges and honors that that this is a this is a knowledge base social justice all, all of the stuff that we're talking about all of the things that are named all of these dynamics and um, disciplines that it comes out it is a knowledge base um, and we want to pay attention to as with anything how that knowledge gets used right um, and so we don't want to use this knowledge in a way or an the ideology in a way that is hurtful or harmful. Um, or again, limits our uh, abilities to kind of move our efforts forward. We'll take one more question and then we'll um, continue on and then we'll come back to some of the other questions that are up Perfect. right now. Okay, great. So Claudine asks, how would this look if someone attends a learning opportunity with a comment, quote, I have not experienced racism and I am married to a white man and we have children. I feel like the conversation is blown out of proportion, end quote. How do we begin to navigate and explore the answer without redirecting to the group and without employing the three C's? Hmm, that's a, okay. Uh, so, say that first part of it one more time. Yeah. So it says, how would this look if someone mm -hmm. attends a learning opportunity with a comment, quote, I have not experienced racism and I am married to a white man and we have children. I feel like the conversation is going out of proportion, end okay. quote. Let's pause there. So I am married to a white man and I have not experienced racism. And what has not been named in that is that we are assuming that, or, or what's not been named in that is the race of the person who's saying it. Right. So I'm I'm assuming that based upon what we're talking about, that that is a person of color. Yes. Claudine mm -hmm. just said they are a person of color. Yes. Okay, right. So it's a person of color who has not experienced a racism and I am married to a white man. And what was it? Was there any more of that? I feel like the conversation is blown out of proportion. Okay. Right. That's the end of the statement. And then the question is, how do we begin to navigate and explore the answer without redirecting the group and without employing the three C's? So without redirecting it to the group or employing the three C's. So here's what I want to offer. A couple of things. One, so I appreciate the question. One, um, redirecting to the group is always an opportunity. Um, without redirecting it to the group, I'm not sure... Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying that's the strategy or the intervention always, but uh, often um, there's a very powerful, depending upon where you are, powerful learning opportunity when the learning comes from amongst us, right? And so, you know, someone else might be like that person. So I'm a person of color. I've been, I'm married to a white person. And so here's how my experience is different than that, right? So, so that's a opportunity where I don't have to necessarily just show up as teacher um, if I'm in the facilitator role. And um, how else I can um, engage that conversation is invite that uh, uh, in the room. How many folks um, relate or how many folks have seen that? How many folks um, would agree that they haven't experienced this kind of, uh, racism or whatever? So there are a number of folks who would name that they have not experienced racism how many folks would say that they have, right? <laughs> so your experience does not have to um, be invalidated for others' experiences to be real, right? And um, your feeling or a particular person's feeling about it being blown out of proportion um, is based upon what their experience is. I feel like it's being blown out of proportion because I've not experienced it. Right, and so just to help folks um, to understand, and that is why utilizing the knowing and the experiences of the group is an important space, right? Um, so there isn't, uh, and what I'm offering here is strategy, not not the right right answer, because again, I don't know what's in the room, and it depends upon what comes up from that space. 
in terms of how you might continue the dialogue, but there, there may be an opportunity or a teachable moment in that and where you, where you get to share what your own journey was or how you relate to what that person's experience was. And, you know, is there, you know, part of what I often will say to folks, particularly if you're facilitating and you're leading a discussion, is there ever, has there ever been a place where you felt like, well, I don't see that, or I think this is being blown out of proportion. It's more than what I see. And so if you can relate to the energy, um, then you can show up um, not necessarily operating in the three C. So if you can relate to when you haven't seen the issue as big, if you can find that in you, you can be in a different conversation and engagement with the person. That person generally isn't sharing that um, because they necessarily want to do harm. They often are sharing it because it is what they see. Um, and it has been their experience. I very much can relate um, to being in the space in my own racial consciousness and my own racialized identity, knowing where I would say that, um, where I would have been able to say a similar kind of comment, uh, right? And so just because I had not experienced racism or just because I hadn't felt racism doesn't mean I hadn't experienced it, right? So. Uh, and uh, I might have been calling it something else because I didn't know how to call it that or how to engage it as that or, or and so on. So it's with the intention of knowing that we're all in different places on the journey and that if we are in the role of facilitator educator, we want to bring people along um, on, on that journey. Um, one of the things that I will often share is that we have been taught, particularly in traditional kind of higher ed student affairs, um, psycho psych psychology or counseling or sociology spaces, to meet people where they are, right? Um, and so the importance of being able to, to meet that person, meet that woman in the space that, that she is. So meet them where they are. What we have not been able to do as effectively is be with them in that space. So we have met people where they are and got, and so here I am, I'm, I'm meeting you where you are. But when we've gotten to the space, we have actively grabbed them by the collar and attempted to drag them to where we need them to be. So the meeting a person where they are is only the first part of the work. The next part of the work is staying with them where they are long enough to understand why their perspective or worldview is different than yours, right? So, okay, so you've not experienced um, racism. Talk um, a little bit about what, you know, kind of why this comment is coming up for you. Why do you feel like this is being blown out of proportion? How does it feel for you as it's being blown out of proportion? And so in some ways, the part of what I'm, I, even as I'm talking about this, I'm imagining that some of this is feeling like, well, you talking about my husband. You making my relationship bad. You making my the the person that I love wrong, right? Um, and so, if you're talking about whiteness or white people, and so that's some of what might be coming up. So, an attempt to stay with people long enough to find out what's going on, what the energy is about, is some of what's important as you move folks along and not show up as this person is just not woke. I'm woke, right? Um, uh, uh, they're they're um, in collusion or they're in internalized oppression. And um, so I'm, you know, I, I feel like I need to get them right or, or straight um, versus kind of being with them on a journey to come to a knowing themselves. I'll keep moving. Um, uh, we've got, uh, got about uh, a few more things I want to get us in on before I move. Is that okay? Can we hold? Uh, do we have some more questions coming? Okay, I'll just keep moving. All right, excellent. So here's what I want to talk about. Um, similarly to what I've already named is some, some key concepts and dynamics to um, Woke Olympics and what shows up in that. So Woke Olympics and social justice arrogance can often unintentionally sabotage efforts um, as it reduces an environment of safety, safety and bravery for engagement. Um, so uh, in that kind of space, in the example that was named so beautifully um, around a person of color names 
they haven't experienced racism uh, and, uh, and I'm married to a white person, uh, are we engaging that person um, in a way that has us not shut down the environment for anyone else showing up in their truth? Right. So if that person makes that statement and I just show up and well, that's about your internalized oppression. Well, it could be, you know, I'm not saying it's not. Um, and how am I going to be in that conversation that helps that person even know what internalized oppression is about? Right. Um, and if I show up in that way with that person, it does not just impact that person, it impacts the room. Um, and so if I'm sitting in the room and I happen to be another person of color and while I'm not married to a white person, I feel like this is being blown out of proportion too and I haven't experienced racism. So I don't dare say that or anything else that's going to get me in trouble with the social justice police, right? Um, so it impacts and creates an environment that reduces the space for people to show up authentically um, um, in what their, what their individual um, lived truth is. Um, what I will sometimes share in this conversation is that most of all of us operate in this discussion at the individual, at the group, and at the systems level. Those three different spaces are in operation all the time. But most of us have only um, engaged at best at the individual level. And maybe if we've studied or come from an environment that invites us to some systems or uh, organization and cultural level, we've engaged at those. So I'm, a, I'm an individual, I show up as a good individual engaging, um, here's how, what my, how I know about my experience, and then here's what my analysis has been of a system. And that, um, that those two parts of the dynamic um, leaves out the middle place, which is um, owning our group experiences. And so as an individual uh, black person, I may not have ever experienced racism, but as I own that I'm a member of the group of black people, do I know black people who have? And how is my experience different from theirs? And what do I think that's about, right? If I don't own my group identity, then I'm likely to stay at the individual and interpersonal level and often then not able to see how the systems and uh, cultures have been set up to treat certain groups differently than others. So creating an environment that um, uh, unintentionally sabotages efforts for bravery um, prevents us from being able to help folks see that your individual experience is one piece of the analysis that you need to be able to navigate um, creating a full diversity, equity, and inclusion in your communities. The next one is Woja is often difficult to address as it is loaded with accurate information but poor engagement. Like I just said in the example uh, before, if I just simply say, well, that's about your internalized oppression or about your co collusion um, or about complicity, right? Um, the, then that then uh, while the information may be accurate, the engagement of it um, does not create um, the energy for deeper exploration, right? Um, and we can't control all of that. We can't absolutely say everybody is going to explore simply because I um, asked the right question or I don't, um, you know, call them out. But uh, you know, uh, but we can definitely create an environment where we can assure that that's not likely to happen, right? Um, and so as you see in the next statement there, um, uh, Woke Olympics often then takes us to Greece um, an intention to call out and not call in or invite in. And so uh, some folks have pushed back on me um, around some of this language that, 
call in and invite is um, supporting of dominant culture or dominant folks or white supremacy or um, uh, it's it, it's the it's an extra labor on the minoritized persons and uh, uh, and so the, the minoritized person always have to deal with the impact um, and so sometimes some people just need to be called out I don't disagree with any of that <laughs> um, I absolutely do feel sometimes that it's important for people to be called out. What I'm talking about here, um, particularly in this context, um, as I was doing this session at NCOR, when I talk about calling in and inviting in, I'm talking about in our roles as educators. Um, and what is the, my positionality at the moment? And how does my position and my access and my privilege give me an opportunity to create an environment that is going to be a learning space and a space where folks can do that deeper unpacking and finding themselves and finding where the um, uh, internalized oppression or heterosexist or homophobic or misogynist or ableist um, or uh, ethnocentric space has been ingrained in them. Um, and or am I going to call them out that shuts them down from being even able to look at that? And so the call in and invite in um, context or dynamic is one that says my intention in my comment is to invite you on the journey that I've gone on. Um, and so uh, under that is I haven't always been here. I didn't wake up social justice Sally or social justice Jamie. I have been on a learning journey. Uh, and so I didn't get here, uh, you know, kind of accidentally. Somebody had grace and kindness and educated me. Um, so call in and invite in is to invite people into the journey. The litmus text, test, that should be a test, not text. The litmus test and gotcha culture. Um, and what I mean by that is, that when we create um, an environment of social justice, arrogance, and woke Olympics, it's often felt that someone is just waiting for me to mess up. Uh, and so if I'm getting up, as I, I'm, I'm a vice president, I'm a dean, I'm a director, I'm doing an announcement, I'm doing an acknowledgement, I'm doing an opening of something, and I'm feeling the energy of folks in the room simply waiting for me to get it wrong. Uh, uh, and so it's a gotcha culture. Yes, you started with your pronouns, but when you did the land acknowledgement, you pronounced the tribes wrong. Um, yes, you did the land acknowledgement. Well, but you stumbled over LGBTQ, A and I. Yes, you did this, but you used ableist language when you were engaging, um, uh, if we could just all get up and walk to the back of the room. Um, and so uh, someone is waiting to get me um, and it creates a gotcha culture. And a gotcha culture is not an environment where it is safe to really just kind of fully be and be able to learn in those spaces that you um, might not know you often are in those spaces walking on or moving on, there you go, eggshells, right? Uh, because I don't want to get it wrong. And this becomes particularly a challenge when folks are in position. So if you are the diversity person, you're the director of equity and inclusion, you're the um, social justice educator for your campus, you're, um, uh, the dean of students, the vice president, you know, you, you, because of your title and you're, you're supposed to show up knowing, but particularly if you've got a diversity piece in your title, you got to know everything about everything, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I noticed this dynamic, particularly with my colleagues who work in multicultural affairs or within diversity, equity, and inclusion offices, we've shifted those names. And, you know, I might have come into this work because of my commitment to work with Latinx and Chicana, um, or folks of Latin descent, 
um, my passion for that. I've studied that. That's my area. That's my people. That's what I come in knowing and engaging. And I'm here at this campus because I want to make sure that um, uh, that population is moving through successfully, that they have a role model, that they have someone they can talk to that understands their experience. And now um, what I've been invited into is we pulled all those centers together. And so the uh, Asian Pacific Islander, Native American and Indigenous, African American folks of African descent, Latinx folks. They've now we just won't put everybody. We just gonna get one unit. We gonna put y'all all in the same space and y'all in the same space. And y'all are supposed to know everything about each other. When in fact, when would that have happened, right? Um, and so there can be a sense when you get into those kind of spaces if social justice arrogance and woke olympics is playing out um, that we can do harm to each other because we don't know each other's experience language history culture the dynamics and ways things play out in our particular communities uh, throw in um, lgbt lgbtq a and i plus into that mix and you've got a whole nother dynamic that shows up because in many of those spaces you enter then not only minoritized folks of color, you often enter folks who identify as white. Um, so the gotcha culture. Um, Woke Olympics um, and social justice arrogance also posits an understanding of intent and impact, but behaves with little to no embodiment of it. So what that means for me as I talk about it is we are often, um, as again, kind of that woke Olympics person or social justice arrogant person, we know the concept of intent and impact. And we often um, hurl that as a way to make folks who may have done harm to focus on your impact. Um, it's not just about what your intent is and I don't care what your intent is and I don't wanna hear what your intent is. And while doing that, we're not paying attention to the impact of the way we're engaging. So. Um, the intention may be to help others learn or to know why this is problematic, but the impact is shame, blame, convincing, converting. That's the impact of the way that we've shown up in that conversation. So there is a kind of cognitive knowing around um, how intent and impact plays out, but we're not embodying that with intention around how we engage um, when things happen. The last thing there is that when folks are triggered um, in this whole woke Olympics dynamic, we often are triggered out of our minoritized identity. So I might get triggered as a black man, but in woke Olympics, I might show up in dominance and or privilege. So I show up in arrogance and intellectual knowing um, uh, uh, as an academic, as a scholar, as a PhD, um, as a person who studied abroad, as a person who's done all of this stuff. Um, and so I show up in the arrogance of all of my knowing and where I come from and what I'm able to do and how I'm able to articulate this stuff in ways that you are not um, to make you feel like less than, to make you feel like you don't know, um, to let you know just how smart I am and how um, not you are. Uh, and so, one of those sneaky ways that woke Olympics and social justice arrogance can play out is in a moment of being triggered. And so I'm triggered and I'm impacted out of my minoritized identity, but my response um, shows up and manifests out of dominance and privilege. Pause. <laughs> so we have um we're right at 410 yep. um and i want to give folks the opportunity because because there are lots of questions so just want to make sure folks have that opportunity great thank you so lakendra said where might the appearance of wosha or quote making people feel bad when addressing inequity or potentially tainted comments actually be pushing back against feeling called out. I'm not 100% sure I understand the question. Um, I'll ask it again. 
So where might these appearances of WOSHA mm -hmm. or making people feel bad when addressing inequity or potentially tainted comments actually, um, I think it might be become pushing back against feeling called out. Sure. How might the persons be, how might the person, people be responding out of the experience of feeling called out? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I think I, um, and I'm hoping that I'm addressing this. I think that, um, so when, when, when does uh, woke Olympics or social just arrogance, um, get, you know, kind of get put there, um, or it get, that gets what is named as happening or, you know, kind of the feeling is what is happening when in fact what is going on is simply my naming a dynamic or calling something into question and a person is responding out of discomfort or whatever from having that being called into question. And so um, what I want to offer is uh, that that absolutely is a possibility, right? So that um, I, I did not call you out or um, I did not um, try to convince convert or, you know, I didn't do, I wasn't doing any of that. What I was actually was just inviting or naming what my experience is in the room, right? And so, for example, I might name that um, I've experienced that every time a black person has spoken, um, their experience has not been acknowledged, right? And so um, you're calling that woke Olympics, and and so the and um, and this comes up in my in my last piece around that I have to check what my intention was in that, right? And so was my intention to show how woke I was around being able to read the room and see the dynamics, or was my intention um, actually to raise to our consciousness a pattern of behavior? that is happening in the room that I'm not sure other people are noticing, right? So it goes back to, yes, our practice of naming and addressing and engaging dynamics of social justice, injustice and difference can get seen and we could get um, called uh, social justice police or, you know, kind of showing up in social justice arrogance that doesn't necessarily make it that because that is another way resistance will show up and so i re fully get that what i was what i'm talking about in this space is when in fact our intention is to show up as if we know more if we are better and so at the end of the day what is your intention in your comment what was your intention in naming that for the person? Um, and was it about creating a space of inviting in for their learning? Or was it about getting them straight? Was it about making them wrong, right? That is a critical piece in the how you can, you know, kind of distinguish and tease that out and live, live in the tension of that. Yes, yeah, somebody can label me or label my interaction as being woke Olympics or social justice arrogance. Um, what I want to do is check that, check myself around that. And was that what was coming out? Um, or was that not what was coming out or what I was sending? You were receiving that out of your own resistance or struggle with it being true or your privilege or, um, or whatever, right? So it's, 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 a, it's a tension around intention. Um. So LaKendra said, thank you for helping give her the language to sit with and be better equipped in those moments. Um, we have another question that says, is there a difference between reinforcing or adjusting behavioral norms within an organization and Woke Olympics social justice arrogance? For example, repeatedly challenging a viewpoint or opinion that is uninformed versus shaming someone for ignorance. What defines the difference? Intention, <laughs> All right? Um, so, um, you know, kind of, kind of the repeatedly naming, inviting folks to consider. The the intention is to, if if my intention is to to uh, to reiterate yet again that this is what's happening, or this is what I'm experiencing, and this is what the impact is, and so on. Um, 
versus um, my intention is to make you an idiot. Um, my intention is to make you um, feel um, your commitment to this issue is not real, right? Um, if the intention um, at the end of the day is harm and not help, then um, that that's kind of the distinction for me, right? And so I'm always paying attention to my, and that's why so importantly for me as we are in this work is the work of self-healing, community healing, self-care, community care, um, so that when we show up engaged in these conversations in this way, that we are showing up as clearer instruments, right? Um, uh, and not necessarily with um, the, a legacy of unhealed pain. Like we've got a legacy of experience and um, residual impacts and all of that stuff, but that's why it's so important for there to be space for we, uh, for us to navigate battle fatigue, for us to navigate um, the isolation and the aloneness and the emotional labor that is um, in place or that, that, we, that we deal with often as minoritized folks as we navigate these things um, so that I can be in it. Um, and folks, I really can't emphasize enough how important it is not to make people wrong who don't wanna be in it. Um, who, or who don't feel like they can be in it um, without calling people out or taking people out, right? So, so I, don't, I don't make people wrong uh, in that space. What I'm offering is how do we be most effective um, in helping to move organizations and campuses forward? And why I'm saying that is I have not found shame and blame and doing harm as effective learning tools. That's just not what I've found. I've just not found that. Um, uh, dehumanizing people, I've not found it helpful uh, in helping people to learn. And I'm not saying no one's ever learned from shame, blame, or, or, or harm. I'm not saying that because, you know, life lessons. But that's not the educator that I want to be. Um, I don't want to create spaces of trauma um, for folks. Uh, nor do I want to uh, create spaces where people's humanity feel like it's um, not taken into consideration. Even when I'm pissed as at you, <laughs> when I, like, like I just can't understand why you don't get this. This just feel like, like you don't want, even when I, even in that space, and I have been in those spaces often, what I want to be able to do at the end of the day is when I lay my head on my pillow is know that I did not show up with the intention to do harm. That's a value that I hold. So we have three more questions. Um, so it says, thank you for the three C's. I'm understanding that it's important to avoid positioning them as outcomes, whether consciously or subconsciously. Would a more effective outcome be to reach a common understanding or to surface the various perspectives and experiences in the room? Or what would you... Yep. And so uh, thank you for that question. Um, so here's what I um, often offer in place of the three C's is the three F's. And for me, the three F's are felt, found, and feel. So instead of convincing, converting, and convicting, what I do is, as I named earlier, is I invite people on a journey, which is my journey, if I'm able to do that. So it's an intervention that I'm talking about or a strategy. So someone says, um, like uh, was named earlier in, in, in the webinar, um, I've not experienced racism as a person of color and um, I'm married to a white person. So in essence, what that, the, the unnamed the, of, of that, the syntax of that is I'm a person of color and this hasn't happened to me and I'm close to white people, right? So. Um, so there can't be racism, or this is being made bigger. This is not true for everybody. That's the unnamed in that, as I receive it. So if a three Fs would be, for me, instead of convincing, converting, or convicting, would be is, first, I felt the same way. When I arrived here at um, whatever university, um, uh, as a first year student when I got here, um, 
I felt that, you know, kind of racism was just, you know, the Ku Klux Klan and, you know, someone had done a noose or, so I didn't feel like I had experienced um, any racism. Nobody had ever called me uh, 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 N-word or anything like that. That's what I, um, so I didn't, I felt that, you know, there wasn't really, um, ra you know, that much racism where I was because I didn't um, feel it. Well, then I found that I was impacted by racism, even though I wasn't feeling it. I didn't realize that I had come from school systems that had received the second books or the third books. I didn't realize that I had come from communities that had been redlined and thus for the grocery stores in that space. I didn't realize that um, there were so many other ways in which um, I was assumed to be the exception um, and that I was different than the others, how that was a manifestation of racism. So I felt and then I found that these things also represent ways in which um, minoritization through the lens of race was showing up. And so today I feel, felt, found, feel, today I feel that as I consider how race and racism shows up, it didn't necessarily look like the way I thought it had to look in order for it to be. Um, and so um, I see what I didn't feel before all the time now. I feel it very differently because I didn't have an analysis of what that looked like before um, when I was talking about it. And so, um, and what I also didn't realize was that it wasn't about white people being mean to me as a person um, necessarily. Some of that was happening at the interpersonal level, but they didn't necessarily know that either um, in their comments and their microaggressions and their implicit bias and all of those things. Um, so I see that differently today. So felt, found, feel. That was really powerful. That is a lesson in communication. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> that is a lesson in communication. We have time for one more question, even though we have four more questions. Okay. Um, we have time for one more. And so Kimberly asks, how do you recommend responding when students are calling each other out within a learning environment? Yeah, so that's a big one right now um, for us to have to navigate and deal with that. Um, that students don't necessarily have all the skills um, to engage um, in the F, the three Fs. Um, that you know, the only wep the only way that they know to often engage is from a weaponized place. There's an energy that feels like that's an important way. And so, what do we do? Um, and so, I, I often will return us to it's important to create environments that are helpful for learning. And so, that if we're creating a space we must start with learning community agreements, right? So how do we agree to behave? How do we agree to operate in this experience such that we all can be heard and engage learning? So it, is this a space for learning? Is that what we want? So then we can refer back to that, right? So when folks are calling each other out, um, we can go back to our learning agreements and learning community um, norms to say, so the, uh, is, even if we don't, um, you know, point specifically to a specific incident, what we get to say is, um, I want to remind us of our learning community norms and agreements, invite us to take deep breaths and um, uh, operate with intention in those, right? Um, I can, that's a intervention. Another intervention might be, um, I am experiencing this as a judgment space, um, or that that comment is judgment and we operate we agreed that we were going to withhold judgment We are going to seek understanding Is anyone else feeling or experiencing that? Right, so just to name the dynamic as you see it, but have set up a way to Engage that from what we've agreed and how we've agreed to operate Right, I do want to say really quickly just a few last things again Just as you go as you're thinking about how do we distinguish things check your intention, right? What's my intention in my comment to uh, both engage the intent and the impact as I said earlier, what's 
not just the intent of the moment, but what's the impact of the way you have shared or what your thinking is. Uh, consider um, the impact and the nuanced complexities of intersectionality and intersecting identity. So I really think that um, I don't want us to leave this thinking, this is all easy, it's either or, it's black and white, um, you know, it's binary, it's not, it's nuanced, it's complex. Uh, some things are coming up based upon intersectionality and intersecting identities. Um, as I said earlier, impacted at our minoritized places, responding out of our dominance. Um, remember that in our roles as educators, hear this last piece, in the role as an educator, we must consider what's important in a learning environment. So I know that everyone who, um, and every time you're engaged with a dynamic around diversity, equity, and inclusion, you're not in the educator role, right? And so sometimes I will hear uh, minoritized folks say, it's not my job to teach, you know, whoever, whatever the other group is, the dominant group is. And um, uh, as a, so as a black man, it's not my job to teach. As a queer man, it's not my job to teach. Heterosexual, it's not my job to teach. As a, that social identity, it is not your job. But as an educator, <laughs> It is your job. <laughs> so to get clear about the role in which you are operating in. And so in my role as an educator, it is my job to educate. And what I must then is create an environment for learning. Outside of your role as an educator, and that's again, that's a whole other webinar. How do we distinguish the, those spaces? then maybe as a, as a black man, as I'm walking to the airport, I'm not in the role of Reverend Dr. Jamie Watson, social justice educator, educator. And someone says the wrong thing, I'm not educating at that moment. It might be a long day, I might be tired, and I, I'm not meeting you where you are. I might just have some things to say, right? But when I get to my class or when I get to my session, that's a different thing. And remember, we all are doing the best we can most of the time. Most of the people who are showing up not as effective didn't get up this morning saying, I'm looking to do some racism today. Hmm. I'm looking to do some transphobia today. Hmm. So it's Tuesday. Let me see when I'm going to do that. Most of us don't show up with the intention to do others harm. I'm not saying some of that's not out there, but I do want us to pay attention to being with people and offering them some grace. Dr. Washington, Reverend Dr. Washington, thank you so much for your expertise and skill and knowledge for this webinar. I couldn't be happier. I just have to tell this small little story that I attended uh, Dr. Washington's session at Encore, and I ran up to him afterwards and said, you have to do this webinar. <laughs> and I just want to let everybody out there in the stratosphere know that generally speaking, that is not how uh, <laughs> facilitators for webinars come to be, uh, that I go to their session and just pull them. Um, there is a very formalized, abstract process that I follow in order to identify folks. But I felt like this was a really important webinar to start our school year off with. Um, that as we do this work, that we think about how we do this work best. And this is a really great framework to start the semester with. So right. thank you very much. Um, you. Participants, you all will get a survey by email tomorrow. Please fill the survey out. It helps us to uh, strengthen our webinar programming. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. Thank you, and have a great semester. Thank you okay. so much. Bye-bye.